I'm sure. What is the picture on the cover of the book? Oh, it's the uh, Charles Bridge. Um, it's like Budapest, you know, that kind of thing, only it's in Prague. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and where I walk daily, going from the old town to the, new, to the lesser town, as it's called. But it's over the uh, Voltava River. How, how much time would you say out of, uh, especially, I guess, the 60s, uh, do you think that you and Yarko spent in Prague? I the impression uh, from the book there were many trips. Uh, it was about seven years. Okay. Mm, it, it, my, it, most of the time it was for the academic year, but a couple of times it was just for the academic semester. Right. And there were many visits just in between, but as far as the research, it was usually a semester or a year, academic year. Mm -hmm. And you got to be close friends with a number of the principal uh, figures in, in, in Czech theater especially. And I wonder if you could just maybe give an anecdote about uh, one or another of them or try to uh, present them just in a nutshell. Most importantly, uh, Svoboda. Um, Svoboda. Svoboda, okay. See, I come from like following the next, you know, <laughs> that's how. Right, it's Slavic, right. And mainly about Svoboda is that, well, oh dear, um, well, the, the big thing about, I guess, Svoboda is what we didn't <coughs> know for all those many, many years or care about because it never really came up was the fact that he was a communist. And uh, during the communist era, we should have realized this. He was allowed to go in and out of uh, uh, th what was then Czechoslovakia, all over the world, where he was. Of course, he was the Met here during <coughs> communism there, uh, designing for the Metropolitan Opera. And, um, and that, was his, that was what he was most known for as a... Set designer, right, exactly. And pretty much all over the world doing things. And it wasn't until uh, the Velvet Revolution that uh, this was pointed out. And all of a sudden, the communists were being, in one way or another, pointed out for problems here and there. And uh, it was, he was a very rich man, finally. Well, he even directed two shows for my husband here. And uh, he could put his money away in other bags. And when it finally came to a court case with him uh, to prove uh, he was accused of being, um, oh, what's the word, an informer. And he really wasn't. For one thing, he wasn't in the country long enough to inform on anything. He was always out of the country. So it was here this man who was well thought of well respected for all those years, all of a sudden was a villain. And he had to prove himself. And uh, he finally did. It was a big court case. He spent every penny he had proving that he was not an informer. He had nothing to do with the Communist Party except that he was a member so that he could work. And this is what he said. If he were a member, he could not have done much of what he did do. Uh, but you know, it's still a problem. His grandson made a movie using much of my husband's uh, research to uh, prove what he was doing. And uh, right now, there's a book being written uh, of a conversation they both made. I uh, found 96 videotapes that were made between Yarka and Joseph Svoboda. And they're writing a book on that. But it's still trying to prove that he was not an informer, that the only reason he was a member of the Communist Party was so that he could work. That's probably the biggest story with him, except that the beautiful work he did all over the world. You know, just to start at the beginning, yeah. you know, maybe you might want to say a few words about how this came to be written and the repository of Yarka's materials that are at Ohio oh. State, just so that everyone's in the... Well, what happened was, uh, um, what, toward the, the, 
once he retired, Yaku retired, uh, and he was still writing, he realized that um, some of this stuff had to go someplace. What do you do with it? So we started to investigate various archives that would be using this. And through some friends, he discovered that Ohio State University had the largest library of Eastern European culture. And he made contact with them. He made contact with Columbia. He made contact with other places. But um, Ohio State sent their curator down, as did Columbia, but it was the only place that promised they could show it, they could take it right away, put it out right away for students to use. And what was odd was Ohio State University was teaching a course in Czech language and culture. I mean, who teaches a course in Czech language any place? But there they were, and they came down, looked over the material, and they said, we bought it. And it was arranged. Um, Yaka died before all the material went there. So I had to uh, arrange. Much of it was packed, but I'm still going into uh, more of it. And much of it was, um, and so I had arranged for, oh, it was something like 25 big boxes to start with that went out there. Then after they looked it over more, they asked, uh, if I could go out there and give some lectures on some of the things they had discovered here, much of, uh, much with 1968, that's what they were most interested in. The Russian invasion, it was really five countries invaded, but the Russians got all the uh, publicity on it. So I went out and I talked just basically about living there and what we discovered, how it was that year that the communists did come in, did take over. And uh, I was amazed at the people that showed up. It was a huge room uh, coming from all of the Eastern European countries. And the next year they asked me to go back again and to give the same kind of lecture. And there were even many more. And grad students would come up and say, um, we didn't know what our thesis was going to be, or, uh, but now we do know after listening to you. So there was a great deal of interest. Finally, uh, after I guess the fourth time I was there, they said, why don't you write this down? Um, this is interesting. You might just forget at some time. Get it all written down. So I said, well, I was, <coughs> excuse me, wanting to do this for the family, my own family, as to some of the things we really did, uh, what was happening. So, okay, I'll put it together. And I took a month off, and I didn't do anything for a month, but sit down, go through diaries, go through tapes we made, all sorts of things. Uh, and I just send them a copy, along with a copy of each member of my family and some close friends. And the next thing I knew is I got a telephone call from Ohio State University saying, we would like to publish this. And that's how it started. So I was shocked, believe me, I was shocked. Delightfully so, of course. But we rewrote and rewrote. It took about two years of going back and forth and the curator, curator came down and went over material and so forth. But uh, that was it. Well, it's, it's a marvelous result. It's more of a comment than a question. But, um, <coughs> um, but many of us worked with the archive, Gloria, Mm. Ah, his old students, yes. So, so first of all, the, the, uh, the, the nature of the collection, I mean, Yarka's um, meticulous visual record keeping, especially. He kept everything, with, with everything. The letter, you know, that, that. But, but your book um, adds to the, um, to the value of being able to research in the collection because usually you, you go into dry stacks and you look at things, but here you know, we're, we're able to actually learn something about the people who are doing the work, the circumstances, mm -hmm. um, and get insights that we would not uh, you know, otherwise have. So that's a comment, not a question. Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. You know. um, certainly meticulous. Um, well, I, I, a lot of avid theater people, theater goers, uh, keep records, journals of, uh, it's almost like keeping playbills of uh, uh, things seen. So there is, on all those trips, there is always a stop in London. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and your ability to go through uh, uh, play by play, or uh, literally, 
your experience of London theater. It's it's uh, the history of uh, contemporary theater uh, or mid twentieth century uh, London theater, and it's it's always fascinating because it's uh, such a a unique perspective that you're able to bring to Every single play we saw was reviewed by him. I'll tell you how we did it. Um, I remember in Rome buying a little portable typewriter, which I still have. And uh, each after, every morning after the play of the night before, no matter where it was, I would put a sheet of paper in it and I'd type the name of the play, the name of the theater, the country, and then I'd pass it on to him. And he would write the review. And I'm not kidding, every single play, hundreds and hundreds of them, that we have, I have copies of them. Mm -hmm. And so have the archives. And I'm surprised that people are interested in them. I really am. They look them up. And, and I, um, I've entertained many students from Prague who are working on their doctoral dissertations. By the way, we have archives here, of course, at, right next door, over there. And uh, they have come here, stayed with me, and come, gone through the archives here, then stayed sometimes a whole month uh, in Ohio going through. Mm -hmm. There's one there right now going through. Mm -hmm. You take questions from the audience? Sure. And by the way, if you can't understand me, please let me know. As you know, I've had a little problem with my mouth. So. I'm asking you a question that you can't possibly answer. And that is what would Yarga have thought about the evolving move uh, by two factions of Americans to get into a third world war? You, you've been in the area uh, all around the world. And what, what, would, what, did he, what would he think of what's going on today? Oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> you know, what can you say? I'm sorry, I can't answer that. I don't know what he would think. Um, but he'd probably just say, that's it. <laughs> I don't know. Well, well I'm very disappointed. Well, well, actually, you know, do you remember when, when we did the event for um, the book on Czechoslovakia? Yarka told the story about how moved he was to be in the theater um, as a protest. Do you remember that story? Oh. No. Uh, 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 oh, do you mean, do you, well, are you talking about the underground that we went yeah, to? Exactly, right. Oh, yeah. oh, that, yes. That, uh, I mean, that might give her some insight into, into Yarka's sense of uh, these kinds of conflicts. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing, we were invited by Václav Havel at the time uh, to what was underground meetings, uh, and literally underground, because some of the best theaters in Prague are underground. You know, it, after all the centuries, building up and building up, some of the best stuff is underneath. And uh, it was under, in fact, the uh, Burian Theater, which is no relation. Burian is one of the top 10 names in Prague, in uh, Czechoslovakia, old, old Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic. And uh, we went there, we found some members from the American Embassy who were invited. And, uh, okay, that, that, I see what you mean. The whole idea there was, um, I, I guess, to keep writing, these were mainly playwrights uh, meeting together. What do we do? All right, we, in ours, uh, they were all, all, also theater managers, theater people in every respect. We will not do any plays from any of these five countries that invaded at that time. Um, we will not do this. We will not write this. We, some of the artists will not show things. Um, we will pretend that we aren't the great country we are, but we will be doing it underneath. Yeah, underground. They were always doing things. I mean, I never gave up, never, uh, in any respect. Um, yeah, many, many years later, he spoke of this. Yeah. In, in a, you know, in a a public meeting where he was, uh, we were celebrating his book on Czech theater. Oh, uh, that's and, right. And yeah. He was moved all those years later to tears, talking about the solidarity uh, uh, of these people and the sense that they had that that, that the theater itself uh, and and being a community in the theater was an expression uh, of freedom 
that, that could not be expressed any other way. Um, I, I just remember that yeah. particularly moving moment. Yeah, that's true, exactly. And that was, then they decided they were going to do Russian plays, because with the Russian plays, they could really say what they meant. Uh, one of them was uh, The Three Sisters. I'll never forget going to see The Three Sisters being directed finally by one of the directors who said he wouldn't direct, but he would direct that. At the end, who were The Three Sisters? They were Czechoslovakia, unable to move. Something was keeping them back. And you never saw such an audience stand up and scream and applaud. The Russians did not know what was going on. They had the faintest idea. But every Czech knew. Yes, the solidarity. Thank you for reminding me of that. But this was one of the greatest things we experienced. The Czechs make like what they would say about the Russians is make like they're not here. We lived um, in a building right behind the hotel where the Russians were ensconced. Uh, so we saw them. All of a sudden, they weren't there. But we knew they were there. They were, the Czechs would say, they're up there, they're over there, they're over there. They're watching, we know, but pretend they're not there. Or if they saw them in the street, they would just pretend they weren't there. Yes, they all, there seemed to be a solidarity as to how they behaved. Yes, indeed. You were aware of this. Yeah. And when Jan Palak immobilized himself, I was against it. I thought, this was terrible. You don't kill yourself. You fight with words. But I was wrong. I was very wrong. Because this made them closer together. The fact that somebody, and many others burned themselves that you didn't hear about. But we did. We knew about it. But yes, it, these things hold them together very, very much. And that was the most important thing. Yeah. Pavel had a, a great capacity as a writer to, uh, to work on, on two levels. Uh, there would be the surface, which would even get past censors uh, in yes. a lot of cases, right? And then there was, you know, just as you characterize uh, mm -hmm. Chekhov and the Three Sisters, uh, there was the subtext, there was the real text, there was the real story, there was uh. the real political statement. And I, I think that's a, uh, a technique that you see in a number of, uh, of writers who, who are, uh, you know, victims of censorship, but it, it I, oddly, I don't know how you feel about it, it seems like it really makes the writer extremely versatile because uh, they can, they, it's like they can pack a double punch. Yes, indeed. Everybody, this is what's interesting. The, the Russians were around there, um, but were unaware mm -hmm. of so much of what he was saying what he was writing, that he could get away with. But what's interesting also, it's in the book, I believe. You know, sometimes I can't remember what I wrote and what I didn't write. I go and check and say, did I write that? Did I say that? But anyway, uh, the first time... Another book, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Havel discovered that he was being bugged was when Yaka was there. Uh, it, it was soon after one of those underground meetings uh, that Yaka was going to interview him and, and in fact, the picture Yaka took of him is in there at that time. As he walked into his apartment, Havel did this to him and said, come this way. And in the middle of the living room was a big ladder. And he asked Yaka to go up the ladder. And then he said, feel behind the chandelier. And you know, uh, let me digress a bit. In some of the awfulest, crummiest little apartments these people lived in, there was always a gorgeous chandelier. Somehow or other, the Czech crystal was always there, beautiful. So he said, put your hand behind there, and what do you feel? And he pulled out a bunch of wires. And Havel said he, that was the first time he knew. He had discovered it just before the author came, that he was being bugged. He didn't know how long he was being bugged, but then they realized everybody was. We knew we were. You know, no uh, no uh, Westerner lived any place without being bugged. We have a few of us anyway. About uh, Let me take a slightly different direction. Uh, Would you speak a little louder, Gloria? I'm okay, sorry. This is 
the wonderful title, as Don said earlier, Breezy Memoir of a Long Peripatetic Marriage. Will you give us the arc of the marriage? <laughs> a little background, because we pick, I picked the book up now with great pleasure, but I, I don't yet know about that. Oh, the peripatetic, it's just... The marriage part. <laughs> you met your... <laughs> oh. Is that part of the narrative? Mm. Well, yeah. But, but I, I'm sorry, I still don't know what you mean, though. Uh, Peripatetic is re referring to this marriage that was back and forth, not the marriage is, oh. no, the marriage is perfect, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it was just we went back and forth, that, that our lives were split, literally split, and we loved it that way. We really did, yeah. But, but, but it might be fun, uh, this uh, might get at good. the beginning of it. Just tell us a bit about some of your early experiences in the theater together and how you met. Uh, oh, well, yeah, that was interesting. Uh, I was a struggling young actress in New York, and there was, there was something called Actors Cues. For 25 cents every Tuesday, you would go to the local um, newsstand and you would buy something called Actors Cues. And this was all people who were casting everything. Broadway, off Broadway, off off Broadway. You know, uh, uh, and then you follow the cues. This is what you would do the rest of the week. You follow. You, walk, you pounded pavements, as we used to say. And one of the um, auditions coming up was for this play called The Doctor's Wife, which was a combination of Moliere and Anatole France. Um, and it needed all these people in there. One was a dumb, uh, a man who married a dumb wife and a dumb wife and so forth. And several of my friends were going to the audition and I said, oh, I don't think I will go. I'm not the type for any of this classical stuff somehow or other. And it was actually one of my friends who forced me to go. He said, now come on, let's go. You're going to try out. That's all that's to it. So I went and I tried out for this thing called the dumb wife. Of course I got it. Uh, I was rather surprised. <laughs> it's the, uh, the, she's, just very basically, uh, she can't speak. She's married to a man who absolutely adores her. And uh, she's just sitting there dumb. So he goes to Scannabelle, this is a Commedia del Arte um, takeoff, naturally, and asks Scannabelle, can you do anything about my wife? She can't speak. Scannabelle, of course, cures her so that she speaks. And she never stops speaking. She goes on and on and on and on. And finally, the husband says too much. He goes back to Scavarell and he says, can you stop her? Get her back. He said, no, I can't get her back, but I can make you deaf. So this is how it <laughs> He makes the husband deaf while the wife goes on and on. And then there's a lawyer that's part of all of this. Um, Bert Remsen played Scatterbell. I don't know if you remember, he did lots of the movies afterwards. But Yaga played lawyer. And um, he was just somebody I met there. And I remember being very fascinated. He had to wear tights. This was in the 17th century period. And he could bend his knees backwards. And that was the first thing I found out about him. <laughs> Can you bend your knees backwards? I can. But anyway, we met, and it wasn't <laughs> until the show was over that we really started going together. And then he started his doctorate after the show. He did another show, and uh, I wasn't in the second show. Uh, by the way, we got reviews. The New York Times said only two people understood what the play was about, and that was Grace DeLeon and the Aquamarian, which is very nice. We liked that. But afterwards, we, he, he started his doctorate. He, he never really wanted to be an actor. He wanted to be a theater professor. He started his doctorate at Columbia, and he was called back into the army. He was at the Second World War with the troops of occupation in Frankfurt, Germany. And uh, hi, Bill Corbett, I saw you speak it. <laughs> um, and then he was called back for the Korean War. And we were married during the Korean War while he was still in uniform. And then he got out with a point system. I don't know if you're all too young, one or two of you, Josh, maybe you remember the point system along with me. It, for, uh, 
how many months or years were you in Europe for the war? How many years were you here? And according to the point system, he was able to get out. And that's when we went to Cornell to uh, and talk about peripatetics. That's what we did from <laughs> New Jersey, Boston, to New York, to Cornell, and then up here. We came here for two years only. It was a teacher's college. And New Yorkers said, well, let's go for two years and then we'll move on. And here we were. We never left, except to go back and forth. But does that answer? <laughs> Delightfully raised. Thank you. <laughs> it's the beginning of the arc. <laughs> moved to Schenectady for a while. Oh, that was awful. <laughs> Talk about making a mistake. I love the stockade, and I, I was teaching at the community college there, and he was still here, and uh, I decided I wanted to move near where we were, where I was teaching. And I don't know what made us. He didn't want to do it, but he did it because I wanted to do it. And the day we moved in, I knew it was a mistake. We stayed there seven months. And one morning he said, do you want to move back? We hadn't sold our old house here um, on Clinton Avenue where we didn't live at McPherson Terrace. And I said, yes. And he said, that's the first time you've smiled in seven months. <laughs> so we moved back. Isn't it true, I think you characterize it, and I, I've always wanted to Power ask you. Power of also. <laughs> but I, the house that you lived in in the stockade was a duplex. Yeah. But, but you didn't know that it was a duplex. Not till we moved in. Then I realized this is why that funny back entrance is there. It was the front entrance going upstairs. Um, no, it was very devastating. My mistake. Mm. But you have it in the book, it was just, it's so wonderfully presented, like, what are these people doing in our house? Oh, boy, yeah. <laughs> well, we're glad that you made it back. We liked Schenectady, it was just, they live in Schenectady, yeah, so. <laughs> this one of your students. That, right there, right? It's William Aiken, who's one of my students, right? Mm -hmm. And know. now... Regarding that. Dear friend, yes. When, you were, when I was a student of yours, you would share your experience as a teacher teaching the city of Albany. And I thought that was a fascinating period where they were very strict, rigid disciplinary system that you would share with, their, with us as a student. But you didn't include that in the book. Was that because you wanted to keep the focus on Yarker's work and your travels to Prague? What was it you said that I said before? When you, you said when you were teaching at uh, Albany, one of the high schools in Albany, in the city of Albany, that the uh, principal was, was extremely uh, rigid in his discipline in the students. Ben Becker? Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, I don't understand the connection. So what what's well, happened? In the book, you didn't. Just mentioned I taught at Albany High School like a sentence or two. No, no. What happened is one year when we came back from Europe, um, <clears throat> it was too late to get. Uh, I would quit my jobs. This is what I would do. That's how come I taught before. I started at Hudson Valley. Then when we were going our first trip to Europe, I quit. Came back. I got a job at the College of Saint Rose. Then it was time to go to Europe again. I quit. Then I came back. We came back too late for uh, me to get a job. So I registered as a substitute teacher for the high school. And that was it. I, I did substitute teaching for uh, a year um, until I got the job at Schenectady Community College. Then when we were going to Europe again, I said, I'm going to Europe. I have to quit. And, and the dean said, well, I quit. Can't you get somebody to take your job for the year and then come back to us and that's what started that. So from there on in I um, got substitute teachers and usually they were Yorkers graduate students because he was head of the graduate program here at the time. Uh, and that was it, yeah. But, oh, I was talking about Ben Becker yeah. to you, right. but not in the book, no. Right. no. He was, do, you, do you think that, I know that, that kind of discipline of students would get you arrested today you think that was an effective way of education, of, of having disciplined students that way? 
the way Ben Becker did it? Oh, yeah. Okay, I guess it came out that he was hitting the students. Yeah, he would shock a student who wasn't behaving. Did I tell you that? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. One of the scariest things about being a teacher is that people will tell you things that you taught them that you've totally forgotten. Oh, dear. Uh, so we, will, we will make you take a, a public position of corporal <laughs> punishment in education today. Yeah. This, really, we, we'd like this to be a conversation. Please join in. Yes. Really. Yes. Um, hi. hi, Esther. So I was just uh, wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, um, you, uh, you used to tell me how easy it was for uh, the archive then to get tenure, for instance, you know, how things changed that, oh. <laughs> that actually he was, he was asked if he wanted it after how many years? I mean, I would just... Oh, no, what, what happened was, yeah, after, we said we'd be here only two years, but the second year, all of a sudden, he got a letter. That's the second year here, saying you are now a tenured professor. And he got so angry. He said, well, what if they said me I'm going to stay here for the rest of my life? That's bad. <laughs> but he did. <laughs> yeah, that was a difference. You, you didn't apply for tenureship, uh, for tenure at that time. You were just told, a committee net, you know, that's the way I got it, too. At Schenectady, a committee net named for me. I had tenure. Yeah. Those were the days. Those were the good old days. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is uh, any good stories about uh, Slovis' visits here? Oh, well, here. Uh, well, he did two shows for Yaka. Um, what day? One was Strindberg, right, Esther? <laughs> um, Dosena, Dosena. Dreamplay. Dreamplay, okay. Dreamplay, that was it. Yeah, and he, he was marvelous because his word was law. That was all that was to it. And he had all sorts of things put up all over the place. He even t told me um, at the, uh, he had to leave before a couch was covered. And he told me what to do. And he said, you do it this way. And this is the size I want these flowers to be. Okay? And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and I did it. But he was very sweet. He was very nice. But that was the way he was. And, and it, things were better after he left here. Because he'd say, do it this way, do it that way, do it that way. And everybody listened to him. No. Oh. And everybody listened to him all over. The Metropolitan Opera did, too. <laughs> I'll tell you about the Metropolitan Opera. He, uh, <clears throat> um, oh, God, I forget. Oh, he, uh, well, what was he? I forget what the opera was. And he never, Svoboda never attended opening night of any of his shows. He refused to. I've done it. Then he went. He might come back later to see them again, but he always had tickets for opening night. So we saw lots of opening nights all over <laughs> that he didn't know what to do with his tickets. And one was the opening night in that opera. And if you had all these complimentary tickets, you had to walk all the way down the aisle someplace. Uh, so we got in line with all these celebrities. And what I heard constantly as we walked down the line is, who are they? Who are they? Who are they? <laughs> but we went places like we saw the ring cycle in Geneva because he had done the ring cycle there and gave us the two tickets. So we just went to Geneva, stayed for a while to see the whole ring cycle there. And we did that in Rome. We did that in many places. It was very nice. But he would never attend an opening night. Never. Mm. I'm going to have people take advantage of the treats and the books and we can... Manja. Manja, and we can continue talking about uh, Well, thank you all for coming. I asked Don, what happens if nobody comes? <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you. So let's say thanks. Thank you very much.